Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Notice I've got my following the CDC guidelines. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. <laughs> well, I hope to clarify that later. But let's learn something from the rest of the world. Uh, as you know, the world is kind of always changing based on where there is low vaccination rates. And right now we have new hotspots. I feel like this is an Olympic report. Uh, Botswana is now ahead of Namibia in, the South, in South Africa. And the new hotspot is actually Indonesia. Uh, interestingly enough, Indo and there's some reasons for that, and we can learn a lot from Indonesia. Now, you may not know where Indonesia is. I've been to Indonesia, but it is an interesting uh, uh, country. It's the world's fourth most populous nation. Uh, it is a vast archipelago of over 17,000 islands, of which 922 are actually permanently inhabited. It stretches along the equator between Southeast Asia and Australia, so it's very important for shipping channels, and in most of uh, it's known for its, its trade and, 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 and some natural resources. But what's interesting is only 6% of the population has been fully vaccinated. So they're one of the lowest populations in the world, and as a result, they've taken over from India and Brazil in the total number of daily cases. With They had over 50,000 new infections just on Friday last week. So what can we learn from them? Well, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, is the Delta virus really worse for children? Well, it's very hard to know because half of these countries, like the Western countries, have been vaccinated. So the new pandemic in those, or epidemic in those countries is of the unvaccinated adults and children who've been unvaccinated. But because they have a whole country that's essentially unvaccinated, you can really get some idea about the Delta virus's impact on kids. So in their country, 12.5% of the country's confirmed cases are actually children. And just last week, in the week of July 12th, 150 children died. 50% uh, of them were under the age of five. And more than 800 children in Indonesia uh, uh, under the age of 18 have died from the virus. So it does seem that the Delta virus actually is worse uh, because we wouldn't know that unless we had a country that was actually unvaccinated. Uh, so what's the state of the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 in the USA? Well, it's, it's not good. Uh, we've had a fourfold increase in new cases day, uh, day over day from last month. Hospitalizations are going up. Every state is reporting an increase. Of course, the largest surges in just in a handful of states, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Florida. And, much, and the infection rates while going up are pretty low in the Northeast and the upper Midwest. The good news, Please, people, listen. The good news is vaccines still work. 97% of hospitalized coronavirus patients are unvaccinated. It's the, this is the disease now of the unvaccinated. And unfortunately, in our country, we still have not yet hit 50% of the country being fully vaccinated. But the disparity between states is like, it's, it's huge. Two-thirds of Vermont residents are fully vaccinated, and only one-third of residents in Alabama and Mississippi. And unfortunately, we're down to only 530 shots per day when we used to be, in the beginning of this, at three and a half million. And as a result, we're seeing a fourth wave. And you can see the spike very clearly. And I've drawn a line here so you can see the difference. We're back to the, almost the level of the surge last summer. So here we go again. It's like a never ending gift or a bad fungus. It never quite goes away. Cases have gone up 172%, hospitalizations are up 57%, deaths are up 19%, and all we have to do is get vaccinated. So where are the hot spots? It's, and they're getting hotter. Every week I show you this, it's getting more and more, uh, more cases per, per capita in Missouri, in Arkansas, Louisiana, Florida, Alabama. And of course there are some states in, uh, or some counties in Texas that are also quite high. And the trouble is, and the real sad part is, where the people are least likely to be vaccinated, that's where the Bay outbreaks are, that's where the hospitalizations are. You can look at current hospitalization hotspots, same places, and those are the places that have the least number of resources. And so the hospitals are being overwhelmed, healthcare workers are being overwhelmed in those counties, in rural counties and parts of uh, the states that don't have a lot of resources. Uh, and so it's really a tale of two worlds in the United States. It's uh, places that are highly vaccinated, and a lot of those cities have the high resources, and places that are unvaccinated where they don't have a lot of medical resources. So it's kind of a mess. So, of course, in Texas, our friends in Dimmick County, 
remain one of the hot spots. I, I can't figure them out. Uh, you know, Lily went down there. The home of the Javelinas, it, it's just every report. They're always in the top uh, per capita. I think it's probably the facility that they have there uh, for relocating kids. The new one is Carnes. Who knew that Carnes County is now a hot spot? But here it is. Uh, Carnes County is, uh, uh, is, is a wonderful place. Carnes City is the county seat. Uh, there's, it's a population of about 14,000 people. It was named for Henry Carnes, a soldier in the Texas Revolution. And it's famous because there used to be a railroad, uh, the uh, Aransas Pass Railroad, that went from San Antonio to Corpus Christi. And as a result, uh, that city sort of emerged. Now there, they have, it's a small place, as I said, 14,000 in the county, but they've had 1,099 cases and uh, 17 per day. So they list very high on a per capita basis. Now what's going on in the Texas Medical Center? <laughs> it's not good, it's like everything else. Our, our number is, you know, well over one, 1.41. 1. Remember, we were three weeks under one. Over one, the virus is winning, under one, we're winning, and the virus has taken over. 1.41, the really don't scratch, uh, and the test positivity rates all the way up to 11 percent. And you remember I was talking about when I would feel comfortable, feeling like there was low virus in the community, be maybe 40 cases per day. We got down to about two to three hundred. We're up to almost 1,500 a day again. And so that's I mean, that's really bad. We have a ton of virus in the community, and not surprisingly hospitalizations are beginning to really go up. We had over 150 hospitalizations per day. So we, we really have a real problem. Now, interestingly enough, hospital mortality hasn't really changed. And you can see over time, if you're hospitalized, it's about 9% a chance that you will, will pass away from, being, uh, from having COVID and being hospitalized. That's not the case fatality rate. That's the hospital fatality rate. Case fatality rate is, you know, all the cases who have been infected, how many people die from, from that, that's probably a hundred or at least tenfold less. So it's, the case fatality rate's probably around 0.8 or 0.9 percent, and there's data for that from the UK. Well, the Delta variant has totally taken over. Look where it's gone from very little to all, it's 83 percent of the viruses in, in our community. And just to show you how infective, infectious it is, there was a case uh, report in the CDC MMWR this past week on a uh, gymnastics facility, 47 people were infected between April 15th and May 3rd, and they calculated the attack rate, and it was 20%. So 20% of the people that were in that facility got infected, and then they looked at the people when they went home, 50% of the households were infected. So highly, highly transmissible virus. So what do we know about the Delta variant? We're learning more and more all the time. You know, it has a, several mutations. It, sort of is different from the UK. It's 50% more uh, transmissible than the original UK variant in Britain, which itself was 50% more transmissible than the original coronavirus. Uh, the good news is it's it only slightly less uh, responsive to the vaccines. Uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J still are very effective against the Delta virus. Unfortunately, CoronaVac and the Sinovac vaccines are not very protective. And remember, we talked last week about the case of two uh, folks from India who had received the CoronaVac and came over here to the U.S. for a wedding. Both of them were infected. They infected other people, and one of them passed away. So what is the evidence that it's more virulent? We were talking about this uh, uh, when I mentioned about Indonesia. The, the, uh, in the U.K., they've calculated the case fatality rate to be around 1.1 percent. The original virus was about 0.5 percent. The UK variant was about 0.9% and the uh, case fatality rate in, in uh, Delta virus is 1.1%. And there was a recent paper from Scotland that was just published in The Lancet that looked at the risk of uh, hospital admissions uh, from Delta variant and it basically doubled. So the, the number of hospitalizations doubled um, with the Delta variant in Scotland. Well, there's a very interesting review paper in Nature Reviews uh, by Miles Davenport and his group at Columbia University, a really uh, good uh, immunology group. And it's an interesting paper. I'll try to describe it to you because it tries to put in perspective how we figure out which vaccines are actually effective. And it is, it's kind of like what determines 
uh, protection from inf infection? What are the parameters we can measure? Uh, we've talked about B cells and neutralizing antibodies. Those are the antibodies that actually are in your plasma. We take them out, we put an assay in a dish, and it, it, it neutralizes the virus. But there are other things that the antibodies do besides neutralization. And of course, we have T cell immunity, C CD4 and CD8 cells, as well, as well as natural killer cells. So what is it that actually determines? You know, we get doing all these vaccines. How does a how does a company or a scientist figure out which of the vaccines is effective other than going and looking in people? So we have these assays that we do. We draw our plasma and we look at antibody levels. We were talking about that last week. So it turns out it's hard because every assay is different. Not everybody does the same assay. But everybody uses uh, convalescent plasma as a control. What convalescent plasma is you got the infection naturally and that plasma is taken out and we look at that as a, a control and look at what the response is if you've not been uh, infected but vaccinated. And it turns out neutralizing antibodies are very, very predictive. I mean, it's really remarkable how predictive they are of efficacy. And so it looks like neutralizing antibodies for this particular vaccine and this virus seem to be predictive. The reason it's important to determine that is neutralizing antibodies and other viral infections are not very predictive, like HIV. They're not predictive of, of benefit. But in this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, neutralizing antibodies seem to be important. And Novavax and Moderna and Pfizer produce the highest levels. J&J uh, &J, uh, is less, AstraZeneca less than that, and actually Coronavac least of all. And the importance of that is if we're following antibodies in people over time, antibodies tend to wane. And so what you want to see is if you've got a lot of antibodies generated, neutralizing antibodies over time, they'll wane. But if you have a high level, you'll be okay. So, you know, even though time passes, virus, your, your um, the antibody levels drop, it's still enough to handle a viral infection. So that's, that's really, really, really important. So, you know, we think at least that for the first 18 months of the pandemic, it looks like neutralizing antibodies are a pretty good indicator of whether or not the vaccines are effective. And you can calculate then what's the likelihood when we, we will need a booster. Uh, it's interesting, though, because there's other data supporting the fact that TMB cells, memory cells, might be able to turn on more antibody as it wanes in response to a virus. So th these are all very interesting scientific points. And it gets back to my my old beaker diagram, making it a little bit more complicated. In addition to the beaker, there's also tends to be a leak of, of antibodies over time, the levels drop. But what we don't know, and this is still unknown, is if antibody levels drop to a low enough that's critical, can your memory B cells and T cells turn the tap on fast enough to still be protective. We won't know that until we begin to see that breakthrough infections happen more and more in people who are vaccinated. And the fact is that right now, vaccinations are incredibly effective. Uh, yes, there are some breakthroughs, but not many. If you look at uh, two countries, Singapore and Israel, both had uh, tremendous success in vaccinating their people. Even in the face of the Delta virus, look at what happened with Israel. The number of people who got infected dropped like a stone. There's been a little bit of a, of, a rec uh, of a bump up, but not much. In Singapore, there's been no bump up, even though the Delta virus is circulating. And in countries that are not vaccinated, Russia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, look at the, the death rate is just dramatic. It's really skyrocketing. So all of this, all this data has led to changing <laughs> the country and moving more towards vaccine mandates. So. The, you know, the, it, it's clear the way out of this is to vaccinate people. Where there's lot, lots of vaccines, people are doing okay. Where there's low vaccination rates in countries or states or counties, they're not doing well. So this is leading more and more communities to require vaccines. The Department of Veterans Administration, the VA, will now require 115,000 of its frontline health workers to be vaccinated. In New York City, Workers in the city-run hospitals and health clinics will be required to get vaccinated. In California, all state employees and, and all on-site public and private health care workers will, are mandated to get vaccinated. And American Hospital Association, the Pediatric Hospital Association, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the American Nurses Association, the American Medical Association, and the VA have all come out in support of mandatory vaccines for health care workers. 
So we're moving that because the data keeps showing more and more that the only protection we really have is through vaccination. Many of the hospitals and major health systems are requiring it. Over 400 colleges and universities are requiring students to be vaccinated. And we now have evidence uh, and some U.S. government guidance that private companies can mandate that their employees get vaccinated. So what about breakthroughs? Breakthroughs are a real problem. You have to look, you always have to pick a date. So as of April 30th, the CDC has reported the number of breakthrough infections. So there was, in, as of April 30th, there was 100 million people uh, that had been fully vaccinated. And the CDC defines a breakthrough infection as detecting SARS-CoV-2 from an RNA or antigen test in anyone who's been vaccinated and after 14 days of their vaccination. So they've had a total, remember, 100 million people vaccinated, only 10,000 breakthrough infections have been reported, median age was 58. Of those, uh, 2,725 or 27% were asymptomatic. 10% uh, of the patients were hospitalized, 995, and 160 patients died, 2%. So 100 million uh, people in, in vaccinated and 160 patients died from COVID-2. COVID so that shows you how incredibly effective the vaccine is. Uh, and it's also an extremely rare event that if you get vaccinated, that you'll be hospitalized with a severe problem or pass away from this. Now, we are seeing more and more people being hospitalized who've been vaccinated because there's a lot of virus out and it's not 100% effective. And so this has led the CDC to start changing its mind again. Remember, originally they said you can, if you've been vaccinated, you can participate in any activities before the pandemic. Uh, you can resume domestic travel, refrain from testing before leaving the country. Uh, you don't have to test or quarantine if you have exposure. But now, because of what's going on in the U.S., the CDC came out and made the following modifications. They said, if you're indoors setting, if you're indoors in an area that has a lot of virus, Arkansas, Louisiana, you know, uh, Florida, you got to be careful. And they're saying you know those communities because you're exposed to so much virus, you should probably uh, be wearing a mask. Uh, and people who are at, at higher risk should be wearing masks. They're also saying if you have symptoms, even though you're vaccinated, you should now get tested. And if you've been exposed to someone, you should wait three to five days. Uh, uh, you should get tested with three to five days after an exposure. And, and you, they're also saying you should probably isolate if you've tested positive for COVID. And they're also suggesting that K through 12, uh, you know, kids in school be masked. And we're having obviously, you know, not every state's allowing that, but it's unfortunate because the CDC and I think they're right. Now, so let me distill this down because my sisters got mad at me last week. Uh, she goes, how can we be having a surge? I mean, half the country's vaccinated. So I had to go reduce it to simple math. If it's one, you know, like our, our number is one, we're doing okay. 50% is of the country's vaccinated. That means half the people are unavailable. Trouble is twice as infectious. So half times two is we're at one again. And we're exactly back to where we were because we now have a much more infectious virus. And even though half of the people are resistant, it's twice as infectious. The problem is we've also gone soft on masking and social distancing. We've opened up, you know, being indoors again with large groups. So it's almost like back to square one. And that's why we're seeing a surge. And then the other thing, it, it, why does the CDC say, you know, think about the, 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 how much virus it is in, in the community before you decide about masking? Well, I, I tried to explain it to my sister this way. You know, if I'm vaccinated and I walk into a room of people who are infected, you know, and it's 85% effective, I can walk into that room 85 times, and I'll, but I'll, I'll get infected 15 times out of 100. That's kind of a lot. So I would want to stay out of that room, or if I go to that room, I'd want to wear a mask. If I'm vaccinated and I go into a room and only one or two people are infected and everybody else is uninfected, well, the chances of my getting infected are very low. And so in those situations, you probably don't need to wear a mask. So if I'm walking around Vermont where everybody's vaccinated, you know, I'm not going to feel very uncomfortable walking into a grocery store. If I'm in Arkansas or Missouri, where only a third of the population is vaccinated, I'm wearing a spacesuit before I get a, get a, get a full quart of milk. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not walking in. I'm just going to stay out of there forever. That's why I said the person who wrote me from St. Louis and said, what should I do? I said, stay at home. Don't go anywhere.
Anyway, it's really too bad because we we're so close. If we just got vaccinated, we would really solve a lot of problems. And now, of course, it's my favorite time, our Olympic update. Uh, on Tuesday, there were 2,800 cases of COVID-19 in Tokyo, exceeding their previous record. So they're on record rate of uh, infection. Uh, the hospitals are preparing for more and more admissions. The uh, Prime Minister uh, Suga said, please refrain from going out unnecessarily and watch the Olympics at home on TV. So, you know, that's a TV mandate. Uh, and of course, uh, as, the, as the Olympics approach, this is the vaccine rate in Japan, <laughs> dropping like a stone. So they've got fewer than 25% of the country uh, vaccinated and they got all these people in. Uh, they've now doubled the number of cases that have been infected. They're up to 155. Several of the athletes are, are infected. And of course, they didn't require athletes to be vaccinated. <laughs> I'm not sure who came up with that rule, but that, that wasn't too smart. Anyway, uh, I have a few shout outs this week. Our new students have arrived. We're very excited. New, new health professionals, we need you. Come quickly. And, and uh, you'll never forget this as long as you live. Uh, we will be requiring vaccinations for our faculty and staff starting September 15th. We're giving a fairly long lead in so people can arrange to be vaccinated. And we're also going back, unfortunately, to mass in public setting or in any group setting where vaccination status is unknown because, I mean, that's consistent with the CDC, but that's just common sense. If I don't know if there's a bunch of people who are vaccinated, I'm, I'm going to wear a mask. And so we're going to do that. And finally, I'm really excited about the fact that despite all the virus and everything, because dogs don't seem to be as affected, Lily did participate in the opening ceremonies and represented the USA very proudly. We're very excited and proud of her for her participation. So have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you until next week.